Welcome everybody, uh, Earth Week 2020, it's the 50th anniversary of Earth Week. Um, and today we have a really exciting workshop with Noah Johnson. Uh, he's out of SOTUS, New York, and he's a mushroom expert. Um, so thank you for joining us. Uh, today, Noah's gonna talk about mushrooms in general, um, you know, the bi basic biology of a mushroom, uh, different sort of species that maybe you could grow in your own home. Um, so exciting stuff. So thanks for joining us and uh, over to you, Noah. Thanks, Kate. Thanks for having me. Uh, I am Noah Johnson from Johnson Brothers Food Forest. And I don't know about an expert in mushrooms, but uh, we'll talk about a little bit of stuff. We'll keep it kind of basic at first. Just really look at the structure of the mushrooms, a little bit of understanding on how they grow, what they do, and different ways we can grow them. We will start with this little PowerPoint, and then we'll switch over to uh, SUNY Oswego, right on campus, the PLL, and we'll take a look at how to grow some mushrooms there and um, a little bit more identification with mycelium, the root structure and whatnot. And we see here we've got some, right, we can see that, that uh, we've got some basic um, cap and stem mushrooms. The stem is the portion then down on top is a cap and underneath you see a little bit of their the gills. Uh, the gills then hold the spores. And um, we also, if we look close on the purplish kind of burgundy color mushroom with the ring around and the ring around we see a little bit of broken off white and that is the ring around the mushroom there as we see there comes in all different shapes and sizes we have uh, not just chem and step cap and stem mushrooms but we have the stink horn the white fuzzy one there coral looking mushrooms and all different colors as we see and so we've got bright anywhere from bright orange to dark and then the trimetas versicolor is uh turkey tail there and we see the variegation in the coloring we see that there's when we get to feel it there's different textures in those rings and trumpets uh the black trumpets are in the middle there i think one of the hardest mushrooms to find out in the wild uh, just because they're so delicate small and and also seem to blend in very well where that bright orange is really popping off of the moss that it's growing in hey noah you've shown us lots of different mushrooms so far i'm curious of a couple of things of the ones that you've shown us so far how many of them could we find in new york state and then my other question is about what sort of, you know, you spoke about the diversity of mushrooms in general. What sort of diversity in mushrooms do we see in New York State? So all these mushrooms that I have pictures of, I have, well, I'm pretty sure on this PowerPoint, I have taken all these pictures and they are locally grown. They are around here somewhere in New York State. I don't think I've added any out of state mushrooms on this PowerPoint. At the slide we're at now, there are cultivated varieties that you will see. So these won't, not all of them will be wild mushrooms. Certainly some are, the, the oyster mushrooms, the grayer ones are a cultivated variety. Now certainly you could find wild oyster ones as well. When we get into cultiv cultivated varieties, we do have some species that are specific that we really enhance. So you might not see a gray dove oyster mushroom around wild, but there will be something very similar. So the parts in the oyster, you're gonna see that the gills run all the way down the stem and continue to run down, uh, where the tooth fungus there, it seems to stop at the stem. And mushrooms do vary by location, have some similar mushrooms inside of the United States and from coast to coast, but there are also, all di also different species. Uh, I think of them as cousins or brothers or, or family members that look a little different but you know we're still related and we have a lot of the same traits we really got to be careful on what we're looking at and a few sayings that will go by is every mushroom is edible with some only once there's old mushroom hunters and there's bold mushroom hunters but there's no old bold mushroom hunters and so i always proceed with caution when i'm looking at it I want to be 200% sure that I have the right mushroom. So as we're looking at this page, based on color, there seems to be three, three pictures of the same mushroom. 
but we can't just base on color alone. Color is going to jump out to me. Bright orange is going to jump out. But then I've got to understand, well, there is chicken of the woods on this slide, but there's also a jack-o'-lantern, which would give us extreme diarrhea and probably nausea. Uh, again, cultivated varieties being very different that I know that these are planted on a certain log or planted in a certain area, but there certainly are competitor species that come in, the other fungi that come in and take over um, or try and take over that log. And there we see also a variety of so many different kinds of mushrooms. Uh, chaga looks much different than everything else. But again, we're gonna run into some cankers on trees that kind of look like chaga from a distance. And so it's practicing, it's studying, and then it's, it's getting familiar with with the mushrooms, the more I see them, the more I touch them, um, the more I experience those, I can really identify, usually from quite a ways away. And then of course, as we get closer, we really look at this, the special body parts. Do you have any sense of like the proportion of poisonous to non-poisonous mushrooms? As a human species, it's said that we only know about 10% of the mushrooms and then 10% of that are edible. The major thing is I've got to understand the mushroom that I want and the mushroom that I don't want. If I'm going to go out in the woods and look for mushrooms, I understand the mushrooms that I do want to look for and then the other poisonous maybe lookalikes or any other lookalikes. This is one of my favorite books, again, The Complete Guide to Mushroom Hunting. And that is basically because it's really entry level and it, it shows me easy to identify mushrooms when I first started that I could then also compare the lookalikes. I tend to reference all of, uh, usually most of my field guides if I'm running into a mushroom that I don't really know. So the spores here, we see on both pictures, we can see spore prints. And that's another part of the mushroom that will help identify things. And so we see underneath the, the white side of the mushroom is it's a polypore here, but underneath we see brown spores being deposited on the log below, which usually we look at well, the, the underside of a mushroom sometimes has the same color as the spores, but in this case it does not where the shiitake next to it, there was a mushroom on top of that shiitake and released the lines there, the spore print, because there wasn't much wind in the, the box. It was ultimately a picked mushroom inside the box in refrigeration and the spores of the mushroom on top dropped down on that. <clears throat> so the spores are kind of like the seeds there, except we need two to make a mate and then it will start some mycelium. And so as those two spores meet up as the same mushroom, then we start to create some hyphae and then the mycelial map. This is what the next level would be when you get to go back and check that spot and you see a mushroom pop up, you'll see this wine cap. And we can kind of see by the pictures here that it's a grayish. We've, we're looking for a kind of charcoal, purple like gray bottom underneath on the gills. And of course that, well, in this situation, that will be the spore print as well. The burgundy top and then the long white stem. It's going to be a very solid stem, not hollow or anything like that. And then you see as it goes by, we just cut the stem butts off. This is typically the way I like to harvest these mushrooms too, because there seems to be, if I cut them at the wood chip level, there's a lot of extra stock that I could have cooked up. And so I tend to pluck them out of the wood chips and then cut the stem butts off. And then it also allows me to move that mushroom later and I take that stem butt, stem butt and put it in another pile of wood chips and then the, again the mycelium continues to take over that new wood chip source. When you remove the stem butt does it mean that there's not going to be any growth anymore any mycelial growth anymore in that spot that you removed it from? Well I'm just pulling out a small little pluck of mushrooms and as you look you'll have just this complete mat of mycelium and we do take out a little bit, but definitely there will still be mushroom mycelium underneath those wood chips, but this mat has been established very much like a, a large tree. And so there's roots that spread, spread long ways. And so I'm not worried about taking the whole bit out. The only thing I, I tend to do is cover back up any mycelium and not have the light hit the mycelium. Adding some fresh wood chips will then help for that mycelium to eat more. And so 
they kind of like the torture of being pulled apart. It then it's at this great map, but as soon as I pull it apart, it then says, well, where can we take over next? And especially if there's fresh wood chips in there, that's the next spot to take over. Again, this is just an example of the harvest. The major things we'll see in the basket of wine caps is again, that ring, these are cut. I don't mean to boast, but I might've harvested these and they're cut perfectly. Uh, it could have been my other brother though, because that looks like Abe's hand in the middle there. Uh, and so you see the ring around these mushrooms. The other thing is we don't see any gills. And that is because a mushroom, as it ages, it tends to expand. And so it will be cupped here and totally enclosed before it's, it's as a young mushroom. Uh, if you think of baby Bellas in the, in the grocery store, those are it. And then white buttons are gonna have a little bit of expansion and then portabellas are super big expanded. And so all of those are the same Latin name, same type of mushroom, they're just different stages of its life. And that can kind of happen with the wine caps here, that as we get these little babies that are all cut in that basket, perfectly enclosed, to me, that's gonna be the best texture because they have all the spores still in it. So as a mushroom ages and it expands, it's also dropping spores. And so it drops it, if you can think kind of in layers. And so the first command layer of spores, it gets released, we start to lose the texture of the mushroom, the meatiness of the mushroom. And then as it grows and as it grows, more spores have been released. And so that texture gets a little tougher and tougher. Uh, and then you got to marinate it and cook it on the grill because it's a big portobello. Um, now, certainly I'll eat them. Um, I have passed the stages of a mushroom snob, but that's just one of the things that it was interesting how uh, marketing can work wonders. as. Um, well, we've got these old mushrooms is basically what they're sitting there with all these big portobellas eventually. We've got these big mushrooms. How can we make them cool and sell them great? And that's, that's what they did. And, and so it was a pretty great idea. I can't blame them. Here we've got a little bit different style of inoculation. And you'll see an example of a log with the fruiting mushrooms in pictures, but then also live when we head down to campus. And you see, I, I love this picture because it shows a variation of ages that can be involved in this process. And so Abe is, is the young man there doing the drilling. And again, this log inoculation has specific tools. And so that's an angle grinder with a specific uh, high speed adapted drill bit stop just for the mushroom producing. So it has a stop on it. We go a certain distance that matches up perfectly with that inoculator tool there in the middle. And this was during a, a farm demonstration that then we had volunteers just take the, take the reins as they wanted. That, that angle grinder spins at a very high rate, but certainly um, all different ages can use it. And, and then you see our little helpers, that what they're doing is covering up the inoculated substrate with wax. And that's a food grade cheese wax combination and all that does is keep some moisture in and protect uh, the bugs from eating it and stuff like that. But that's just a little bit of different technique. We kept it really simple for this presentation because I don't think too many people have uh, the type of, maybe the type of woods that will cut down and then these tools. It, it definitely takes an investment to get in here. Uh, when you have different kind of mushrooms, you've shown us like a different, a couple of different ways to grow them. Like we've seen logs like we see right now. And uh, you showed us earlier how to, uh, you know, basically have a mycelial network in um, wood chips. Can you use every kind of mushroom for each one of those ways? Or are there certain kinds of mushrooms that prefer the logs or prefer the wood chips? Yeah, definitely. So when we get into cultivating varieties, it is specific to what type of substrate are we using? And then even with the type of wood. So as I compare the shiitake to the oyster, I'm going to look for different types of wood to cut down. There are some varieties that can be trees that can be used for both, but they definitely, the oyster is going to prefer, prefer a softer wood where the shiitake is like a harder wood. So the maples and oaks, uh, hard maples, hard oaks are gonna be what the shiitake wants to eat and the softer beaches, soft maples will be what the 
oyster wants to eat. And so it does, does depend. If I took the shiitake mycelium and spread that out in wood chips, nothing's going to happen. It's going to dry up eventually. They're not going to take it over. Where the wine cap mycelium is very different there. And we even think, well, um, some, some mushrooms are going to grow out in the field. The field of garicus and, and different uh, morels are, are then just traveling through the, the dirt. And so every mushroom does have its niche. So with the logs and even with the wood chips that we put in, we've got some resting period here. We've got to wait for the mycelium to grow up this network, this root structure to be strong enough to be able to produce a fruiting body. And so with logs, that typically takes a year at least to two years before they start producing mushrooms. Again, it depends on the wood, the hardest hardness of the wood and the vigor of the mycelium depends on how quickly that mycelium can move. The wine caps at, at campus, you're going to learn that, well, maybe they'll come a lot quicker. There was a nice chunk that we kept together and maybe that then quickly colonizes a spot and, and produces a mushroom fruiting body rather quickly. Typically, I leave about three months and I've seen that, but I've, I've had <clears throat> a lot of different people buy those kits and then the competition is how quick can somebody grow a mushroom <laughs> and i think the quickest one is a month from from putting it down to harvest so it's pretty neat and that really gets the folks that, that buy those kits really excited because then they're checking and seeing oh i've got one i'm and, and replying and so it's a nice fun game that we we get to see there um, again it's the easiest way to do these the mushroom inoculation in the logs we have taught courses on as well, but but it takes it's it's much better in a group. We get then a group of twenty folks or so, and then we all just get to drill some holes and and pop the spawn in, and and then put the wax over. And so here we'll focus a little bit more on trees. We talked about it quickly there, but definitely hardwoods when I'm thinking shiitake, and and each variety is a little different. I said I like the sugar maple. I'm, I stand by that. The other one is a beech tree that, that seems to, at least um, my third grade teacher had a lot of beech that he was cutting down. And so again, there's a, a popular one that he had on his property. And so we could easily take some trees from that. The other major thing is we always try and be sustainable in the woods that we're, so we're cutting down trees to grow mushrooms, to grow food for people. But I've got to respect his woods and not, I'm not clear cutting any woods. And so we're very selective on what trees we take and then how many trees are we taking. And so it's something to really monitor the woods. We can promote healthy woods by thinning out certain areas or overpopulated trees, trees that are too close to each other. And so we can really make some nice room for uh, a mature forest to come up as we take out this middle aged forest and then help in the process. So uh, I'm not gonna take any credit that nature does, but I certainly try and not hurt it as, I, as we go along and, and try and promote some good growth. So Noah, you talked an awful lot about how to identify mushrooms and what sort of resources you use for that. Um, and it seems like that's not so much of an issue when you're cultivating because you know what you're cultivating. Um, but in the process of cultivating, it sounds like you need to figure out what kind of tree you're dealing with. Do you have any suggestions for resources people can use to identify good trees? Hmm. You know, I mean, we definitely have a field guide of trees. I think it's just been that I've been stuck out in the woods my own, the whole entire life and uh and building forts and being outdoors and 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 luckily being around folks that love trees as well and so find your best tree nerd and take a walk in the woods with them and that's that's one of the best things that i did and 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 i can he'll ask me well what what type of mushroom is this and now i ask him what type of tree is this and uh it definitely takes some research but there's uh there's a lot of knowledge out there either uh folks uh, Woodsman's, like I said, my third grade teacher then works in cooperation with the Cornell Co-op Extension of Wayne County. And so there's folks that are involved and really love this stuff. And it would tickle them to to talk about mush, to talk about trees, to talk about anything ecologically. And so you, 
I mean, books are a good entry level. I like the field guides. I get to then look at, well, how many different kind of maples are there? There's a lot of different maples and then what are in my region? But to me, it also takes some experience out in the woods that, and I think that we kind of find that in school too, that we find the teaching is great. It sets a great foundation. And I've got to understand these ideas and principles behind it. But then I also need some hands-on experience and to be able to touch and see and feel and smell. I mean, uh, we've got to use all our senses here to understand what type of tree we're dealing with. And as we practice this, another thing in the, in the books and then outdoors, the more we stay involved in it, the more we see it, the easier it becomes. And, and so it's just like uh, practicing tax law or accounting for Spence. That as I practice this more and more, I really understand and I can spot an issue from a mile away or I can spot a great thing from a mile away as well. And that tends to be then the scene with mushrooms or even trees is now I see this growth structure from a ways away and I understand this how this plot of trees is is growing and and what's the benefit to it and how is it being successful and where is it lacking in in certain areas so it's it's a combination of books friends and and getting out there and just uh picking up leaves and then saying well i i don't know what this is and and asking questions and and looking in some books and being able to find it out there's an abundance of resources out there online and, and in books and, and to take advantage of that is fun. And then we get to spread the knowledge through walks. So I, I like the woods walks the best. I mean, when I get out there and then I really see what kind of trees are around, then I can really experience that in a nice way. And again, now we've got different sataki varieties. And so as it, you thought it was complicated with just like learning tree species and mushrooms, now we've, we've got even more varieties inside of, of the mushrooms. And why they've done this is the, the, cult, the, the number one cultivated mushroom is the white button mushroom. Second is the shiitake. And so a lot of this, there is a lot of indoor cultivation, but there still is a lot of outdoor cultivated varieties as well. And so with, with these shiitakes, to make a full range of mushrooms and to really add to a full season, what they've developed is cold weather strands, wide range strands, and then warm weather strands. And so by picking out the, the mushroom features that they really like, well, this one fruited really cold, let's, let's try and isolate that and take a clone of that and, and continue to, to look at that a little bit closer. We've made this now available where I said the, the wine cap's gonna fruit from 50 to 90 degrees. Well, the shiitakes almost do, but they take it in 10 degree steps. And so we've got this cold weather variety that has popped here. And, and then next will be the wide range, again, when it turns a little bit warmer and then even further. Now, the major thing with shiitakes are we're going to still get a little bit of time off in the summer. In the heat of the summer, it seems to be a little too dry and a little bit too warm for them, right in the middle. And it's a nice break for me because I've got a lot of annual vegetables growing anyways. And so uh, it helps balance some things out there. But it almost does provide a full year of mushrooms minus the winter with natural outdoor varieties. And here you see, uh, I, I just love, I love teaching. I love being part of uh, people that really want to learn this stuff. The kids, this was a middle-aged school group of kids from a local school that came out to the farm and again, wanted to learn about mushrooms. And so we were happy to have them be part of it. They, uh, I think they planned some, some ramps for us too, actually. Um, they just really enjoyed it. and 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 learning about mushrooms and being able to spread that knowledge um, <clears throat> really is, is, is fun. And, and I think the reward, being at market, everybody wants to talk about, well, this is, this, mushroom, this is my mushroom story. And so it seems that either they hate them, they love them, or there's really not much in between. Um, and so either way, they've got a story about them though. Here is an example too, 
with it was a um uh for well it's turned friend at the at the market um and bought a lot of mushrooms but then also wants to grow and wants to be a part of that and then looked out and found this mushroom and there we see that she's taking some great pictures of the underside because the top was a burgundy color and so this was a, the idea well is it a wine cap did this wine cap grow up naturally here we see kind of that the, half, the stem is a little bit hollow it's not quite as solid as those other ones we had cut and also we have this charcoal gill structure but then we're missing the ring that is drawn in in orange that ring should be still around there where it detached from the stem and cap as it grew up and so those are some of the things that while there are certain parts of the mushroom that are close, we really want to wait and identify every little bit and make sure. So. These are pictures out from Seattle. And um, oh, we have an extra little YouTube. Do you want to? Can we? I wonder if we can do that. Um, but I took a trip out to see Paul Stamets, and, uh, and he's kind of. I think the mushroom guru, if you want to talk about an expert, there's there's a person uh, that knows, I mean, a ton. And I took his course on, I wanted to round out my education with some more indoor growing mushrooms because I'm an outdoor guy. I love it outdoors, but how can I, how can I cut out some parts and be, and hold myself more accountable to produce some mycelium and to be able to spread more? And that was the, the setup with that is that I was in a lab coat with a scalpel and, and stuff that I never thought that I would be part of. It, probably one of the safest places right now, if he'll, he won't let you in, but uh, <laughs> that, that place was sterile as could be. So um, I'm sure he's practicing social distancing and, uh, and, and helping with that. But what a beautiful place out there. I mean, I, I love New York. Upstate New York to me is, is home and, and quite beautiful in its own right. But but definitely out in Washington, we had a, a beautiful time, tons of uh, mycelial networks there. And we kind of thought talked about that, Kate and I did, where we met at a, a permaculture course. And um, the farm that I'm renting from, he gave me a magazine and there was a guy on it talking about mushrooms, a, a, a couple actually talk, talking about the mushrooms that they grew. And they're in Toronto, Canada. And I said, I know those folks, and I knew them from this class out in Seattle. And uh, so, of course, I'm going to read the article. And again, they were kind of the laboratory type and really into that and had the setup already. Uh, great couple and, and being successful at it. So it's really neat to meet folks in these classes settings and then see them again years from now and, and again, doing what they do best and, and everybody going a little bit different way, but, but really all we're doing is expanding our own network, just like the mushrooms would, uh, very similar to the internet. And um, so what do you think? Do you want to try this little video here? It's uh, if I don't pump you up about mushrooms, this talk will. We all know the earth is in trouble. We have now entered into 6X, the sixth major extinction on this planet. I often wondered if there was a united organization of organisms, otherwise known as uh-oh, <laughs> and every organism had a, had a right to vote, will we be voted on the planet or off the planet? I think that vote is occurring right now. I want to present to you a suite of six mycological solutions us using fungi, and these solutions are based on mycelium. The mycelium infuses all landscapes, it holds soils together, it's extremely tenacious, this holds up to 30,000 times its mass. They're the grand molecular disassemblers of nature, the soil magicians. They generate the humus soils across the land masses of Earth. We have now discovered that there is a multi-directional transfer of nutrients between plants mitigated by the mycelium. So the mycelium is the mother that is giving nutrients from alder and birch trees to hemlock cedars and Douglas firs. Dusty and I, we like to say on Sunday, this is where we go to church. I'm in love with the old growth forest and I'm a patriotic American because we have those. 
Most of you are familiar with portobello mushrooms, and frankly, I face a big obstacle when I mention mushrooms to somebody, they immediately think portobellos or magic mushrooms, their eyes glaze, glaze over and they think I'm a little crazy. So I hope to pierce that prejudice forever with this group. We call it mycophobia, the irrational fear of the unknown when it comes to fungi. Mushrooms are very fast in their growth, day 21, day 23, day 25. Mushrooms produce strong antibiotics. In fact, we're more closely related to fungi than we are to any other kingdom. A group of 20 eukaryotic microbiologists published a paper two years ago erecting Opisthaconta, a super kingdom that joins animalia and fungi together. We share in common the same pathogens. Fungi don't like to rot from bacteria, and so our best antibiotics come, come from fungi. But here is a mushroom that's past its prime. After they sporulate, they do rot. But I propose to you that the sequence of microbes that occur on rotting mushrooms are essential for the health of the forests that give rise to the trees that create the debris fields that feed the mycelium. And so we can see a mushroom here sporulating, and spores are germinating, and the mycelium forms and goes underground. In a single cubic inch of soil, there can be more than eight miles of these cells. My foot is covering approximately 300 miles of mycelium. This is photomicrographs from Nick Reed and Patrick Hickey. And notice that as the mycelium grows, it conquers territory, and then it begins to net. I've been a scanning electron microscopist for many years. I have thousands of electron micrographs. And when I was staring at the mycelium, I realized that there are microfiltration membranes. We exhale carbon dioxide, so does mycelium. It inhales oxygen, just like we do. But these are essentially externalized stomachs and lungs. And I present to you the concept that these are extended neurological membranes. And in these cavities, these micro cavities form, and as they fuse soils, they absorb water. These are little wells. And inside these wells, the microbial communities begin to form. And so the spongy soil not only resists erosion, but sets up a microbial universe that gives rise to, to a plurality of other organisms. I first proposed in the early 1990s that, that mycelium is Earth's natural internet. When you look at the mycelium, there are, they're highly branched. And if there's one branch that, that, that is broken, then very quickly, because of the nodes of crossing, internet engineers maybe call them hop points, there's alternative pathways for channeling nutrients and information. The mycelium is sentient. It knows that you are there. When you walk across landscapes, it leaps up in the aftermath of your footsteps trying to grab debris. So I believe the invention of the computer internet is an inevitable consequence of a previously proven biologically successful model. The Earth invented the computer internet for its own benefit, and we now, being the top organism on this planet, is trying to allocate resources in order to, to protect the biosphere. Going way out, dark matter conforms to the same mycelial archetype. I believe matter begets life. Life becomes single cells, single cells become strings, strings become chains, chains network. And this is the paradigm that we see throughout the universe. Most of you may not know that fungi were the first organisms to come to land. They came to land 1.3 billion years ago, and plants followed several hundred million years later. How is that possible? It's possible because the mycelium produces oxalic acids and many other acids and enzymes pockmarking rock and grabbing calcium and other minerals and forming calcium oxalates makes the rocks crumble in the first step in the generation of soil. Oxalic acid is two carbon dioxide molecules joined together. So fungi and mycelium sequester carbon dioxide in the form of calcium oxalates and all sorts of other oxalates are also sequestering carbon dioxide through the minerals that are being formed and taken out of the rock matrix. This was first discovered in 1859. This is a photograph by Franz. All right, thanks for joining me with that one. They will we'll provide a link for the rest of the video there for you. And um, then what we find is with most folks as they, they really find a passion and really find something that they love, um, at least uh, as for me, when it's mushrooms, mushroom things show up all over the house. So a little mushroom cups, mushroom cup jackets, and then mushroom muffins actually end up too. So. And that's just one of the many. We, uh, I, 
have decorations and, and all kinds of mushroom stuff that, uh, that at any time someone sees a mushroom, they either usually have to get it for me or tell me about it. And um, so hopefully you'll find a field that, that you really love and someone will always, always think of, of you when they see that too. The, uh, the, the neat thing about mushrooms is that when, when I start to talk about them and then someone else like learns a little bit about them and they start to realize and see these mushrooms more, these mushrooms have been here the whole time. This fungus has been here the whole time. But once we start to realize, well, that's what it's there and someone really has a passion for it, they seem to stick out. And it's not like the, the mushrooms now are on campus because I went there. Now, certainly I'm covered in all types of spores. <coughs> My stuff has all types of spores on it. Um, I, I am a, an inoculated person. And I uh, joked when I was at the course and said, well, are you sure you want me in here? Because I am, I am covered. We took, of course, the, the, the precautionary deal to make sure that I stayed downwind of the HEPA filters and those kind of things. But definitely, in, all throughout the air, there are spores in, in the atmosphere. There are spores in the ground. There are spores in, in wood. And... Um, so they're everywhere, and I think that's kind of what we're realizing is a lot of things are out there, even though we don't see them. There is that that chance for mushrooms, and it just takes a little bit of awareness to really see it later, and then to, to notice and, and to be looking out a little bit more. I'm a big, big advocate of mushrooms in the medicinal field as well, and we also kind of looked at the, the doctrine of signatures here and that we've got one that looks like a brain, the lion's mane there, and it has been proven to repair neurons and help with memory and help with depression. And also then the Rishi, the Ganoderma there, it looks like a lung to me. And a lot of mushrooms then look like ears. And, and so it definitely helps with what that body looks like. And so the, the Ganoderma has been, or the Rishi, Lingzi has been one of the most common mushrooms to help with lung health. And at a point in time like this, uh, I'm taking my mushroom supplements. So, so if you uh, want to reach out, there definitely are those outlets for them. Um, the other thing, we, the, the YouTube video is great if you want to get an in introduction, but there's uh, my son running and that's again by Paul. And that just breaks out on some easy to, uh, easy to do kind of growing at first and really get you get you pumped up on mushrooms I think a fairly simple read I've kept them with kept the books that I've recommended here simple in the fact that this is probably a beginner stage for most folks I mean if you want to get into the growing and gourmet medicinal mushrooms book okay, we can get very technical and if you're a scientist we can certainly figure that out and we can get in there and and talk about that uh, but a lot of it's an entry level and for me, it's planting the spore, planting the seed in in this mushroom growth, and that we can have. And so, we uh, we like to keep it at uh, an entry level, not over complicate things. Uh, you could certainly learn Latin, and I do in certain areas, but we also have common names that we that we use that are that are popular, and people can easily say, and and then communicate. And so, it is learning a new language language of fungi and, and mushrooms and those parts and and then the ecosystem as well and seeing how nicely that connects so uh, yeah, i guess now because we've, we've got only kate and spence do you uh have any questions or criticisms yeah i got a question noah um thinking about what stamets was just saying about the value of the mycelial network um what do you do to sort of honor and you know take good care of that mycelial mycelial network? Do you have any tricks like when you're gardening, for example, or any recommendations for you know how people can interact with with soil and their environment to do good, so to speak, by this by this network? Yeah, so there's I mean a lot of our the beds, it, it depends on what level you're working at. Now with annual crops, I know I've got to till, I know I've got to destroy that soil a little bit, break it down to be able to plant these annuals a little bit easier. 
But I also then take the permaculture aspect of that in, well, how much annual bed do I need compared to, well, then I've got these tree species that are not going to need me to just till up the soil. What I'm going to do instead of there is mulch and add layers of organic nutrients, mulch with wood chips or mulch with the comfrey leaves that are growing around. And really focus on there are big spots that then we can protect and not have to till up. Uh, and certainly then in the, the areas where I need a raised bed, I want to plant lettuce. I'm not going to plant lettuce out in, the, in a patch of grass and just not till anything. So it's, it's a balance between this farming that I do and the conservation. And, but if I can break it up in these zones and then say, well, this is my zone for agriculture that I'm going to put a little bit heavier stuff in. I know I'm going to take some time, pull out weeds, till them up because I know I need these, these types of vegetables to grow. But then I can also leave that to plant a cover crop and let that regroup and, and everything rebuild. But certainly adding more mycelium in, in the form of the, the wood chips will help. The other major thing there is the concern that the earth doesn't know what's best. And, and that is, I think, when we look at the largest structure there, when the honey mushroom takes over this vast area and, and looks like it's killing trees and looks like it's totally decimating an area, do I know better or does mother nature? And that's what I've kind of got to think about is, well, I know what I want and I might want certain things, but if it's not going to allow me to do that, if a certain area is really being taken over by a species, I've got to think long term in that I probably don't know a hundred years from now why that's really happening. And I can see the short term while well, it's taking away my my precious trees, but in the long term, really what it's doing is these the mushrooms are eating and, and decomposing and building up a better landscape for eventually another species to come in. And so I think it's a combination of that really honoring that there's got to be enough spot where we don't continue to till and let that go. And a little natural zone, a little little zone that I take care of intensively. And then also somewhere in between where I can plant some trees, I can wood chip mulch around, I can let kind of grow a little bit more. So that's why I really like the permaculture combination with all of this in that as I respect those different areas, I can certainly do that and let, let the landscape rebuild and, and be able to come back. It definitely will help in the long run if I either take all the nutrients from it and never replenish or if I let it take a little bit of time and switch locations. So. No, I think you did a great job. I think that was a really awesome presentation. Do you have any interest in talking about your business at all? I mean, I, I'm interested in hearing about your business and sort of what you do and, and what that looks like, your favorite parts. Um, you know, so just kind of a, if you feel like talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> of course, yeah. Um, I, I mean, my voice is kind of getting sore, but you can see that I like to talk, and um, and definitely about about mushrooms and about the business. And so, um, again, it's been around for seven years as as an official business here, and the mushrooms are, are the first thing that set us apart. In let's find a niche. Let's find in permaculture let's understand that I want to build up soil but I, and I want to feed the community but I also need to make sure that I've got some financial support as well and I think that's kind of the struggle that I get to see a lot is we've got these two different looks on farming and that we can be the um, organic person that grows a lot of different stuff but really makes no money uh, at the small scale and we've got this other massive farm that at a really large rate, but all they do is one product and super spray and, and really just kind of hurt the environment from a perspective of that. Well, how can we blend everything? Because we can, we're smart enough animals to make this thing work, but we've got to think outside the box and we've really got to practice maybe some older traditions or look at some new ways. And there's a lot of folks out there doing this new kind of stuff 
um, which is really an old kind of stuff. Permaculture basically goes way back to its roots and that I've got to have this mixture. So I love mushrooms and that's what sets us apart. But I've also got to understand I'm, I, I could continue to make it more mushroom focused, but then what I started to create is I've got one kind of pest and that I'm going to have a lot of slugs on property soon. And so if I don't deal with one kind of pest, then what do I, what do, I do? I either kill the pest or I switch it up. Um, and so that's where I think adding in a variety of produce then helps keep these little niches small. And so we I grow different vegetables and um, also trying different fruits. And so adding to the full part, uh, some cut flowers and, and just really finding what, what works for me. And um, not that I grow everything, there's certainly not. I found that I can focus best on a few different niches and, and really do those well that have different types of produce, but do them really well and and not try and do everything because i've overextended myself with that too where i'm going to grow well how many different peppers can we grow we can grow a lot of you know how many different lettuces can we grow certainly a lot but should i just focus on a certain type of green and and then a like a beans or my beans and greens are one of my staples and then mushrooms and then what else can i add a lot of times i focus on what do i like to eat because ultimately if somebody doesn't buy it i'm probably going to eat it and um, and then also feeding the community. And, and um, this is the part I don't like to talk about, but certainly if you're in a food bank and you see a bunch of uh, Swiss chard, <laughs> I probably dropped it off um, because a lot of that is canned food. And, and to me, it's just not, I don't know, I, I'm not a huge fan of it. I mean, it certainly helps in certain situations. In the winter, upstate New York, we've got to deal with some canned food. But in the summertime, there's, not a lot of reasons to, for me to eat a bunch of canned vegetables. And, and I mean, I'm constantly eating out in the field. So I get my full share of dirt and, and fresh green beans and stuff like that. So um, you can probably find me most Saturdays at the Syracuse market right now. That was one of the things we started at a little local market in Syrac or Sotus, Sotus, New York, small town up by the Lake Ontario. And um and that's where it all started. And it, the Wednesday market, they, I love that market. I'll always be a big fan of it. And I think it's one of the best little local markets you could find around Wayne County, not to exclude any others. So they're all doing their great jobs. But, um, but it was just a great group of folks to work with. The vendors were tons of fun. But I got to a level where I had a little bit too much produce for that, that sodas market, but not enough to be in two locations in one week. And so it's a, it's a slow growing process, but I wouldn't want it any other way because it's just been these little steps up and I've been able to see, well, this isn't quite working at this step. And so I, it's a learning process, even for me, um, continuing to figure out what do clients like or what do the, the folks at market really want? What price points do they really want? Um, and then what kind of certifications and stuff like that. So that's the next process is getting these mushrooms organic certified that, and we're, we're trying to look into doing it like that. So, um, follow all the rules, I believe in it. And I think most permaculture folks do, uh, and it was then a way on, well, in the beginning, is it, is it worth the organic certification? And, and then in the future, is it? And so it's kind of a balance for me looking at that perspective there. Should I go through all the, the extra paperwork and stuff? I tend to have a great relationship with the, the folks at market. I mean, it, it's not just something where they quick run by and, well, we want this and, and they run by and, and, and go. It's been a lot of conversations and in and maybe that's the mushroom part of it that the, the most talkative folks stop by the mushroom guy. And, uh, and I love it though, because, because we're just talking about things that I love. And, um, and so different produce, I like to offer at lower prices and, and, and let them, you know, enjoy that too. So it's just, I think ultimately it's a combination that, I've, that I really respected in permaculture was the fair share and then the environment. And so I've got to then really take care of my neighbors and, and understand that, well, I can give some stuff away. Um, luckily, I've 
feel I just I feel pretty lucky in my situation that I can eat some of the best food ever and uh, then sell it and have fun with that and um, and being that uh, my skills have then also added to others other streams of income as seasonal seasonal stuff so so Spence is is the accounting pro and like the the business the bookkeeping that I did for the farm allowed me to then find a tax job and, and be able to find that off season income as well. And so, uh, you know, could I, my next step would probably be a building so I could do some more indoor cultivation. It's going to take a bigger finance deal and, uh, and some, some, in, uh, some capital investment there, but it would definitely then help, uh, uh, extend the seasons a little bit more with some indoor growing and, and some cultivating of mycelium. Because it seems like a lot of folks then do want to get involved in growing and and that's super fun to me and the education again been asked to, to do a lot of different talks and something that I really like to be part of with that too so <clears throat> it shows Noah <clears throat> I can tell that you love what you do and it's beautiful <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that is pretty obvious. Um, so, and I'm and I'm glad. I mean, that you can't fake it, and and if you can, you know, I mean, people are going to be able to tell. So, um, you know, eventually I get more more and more people talking to me about mushrooms and adding me and showing me pictures and stuff like that. And it, it's just yeah, like cool. I said, continuing to build the network up, and and as we continue to expand, you know, you'll meet somebody new and, and then I'll meet somebody new and then they'll meet each other too. And, and then uh, continue to grow and, and, and improve as we improve this environment and improve our own health, we can really then take a step back and, and see that we're making, making big improvements that way. And I think we're starting to realize now that the, the ecological health and our own health is very important. And, and what can we do to help, help secure that? Yeah, they're certainly tied together. Um, it seems like farmers markets, local farmers markets are really experiencing a resurgence. Um, and so mushrooms are, are increasingly prevalent at these sorts of things. Um, have you noticed just like a, any bit of a shift um, in, in numbers? You know, have you noticed that um, all of a sudden mushrooms were a lot more popular or, or something people were looking for in particular where maybe in years past it wasn't a big ticket item perhaps well i st i still think i mean people love it and um at least the experience that i had in the small little market like i was the mushroom man and i was i was it for for a while there was another person that, that came in with mushrooms and unfortunately they didn't stay along i i like competition there's nothing wrong with some competition it does seem that that mushrooms are becoming more popular which I'm not surprised like the, the flavors, the, the, the only issue with a lot of folks is like Paul said, that we, we think about the white button mushroom or the portobello, we really haven't experienced the nuttiness of a shiitake or the, the texture of chicken of the woods and the, uh, the seafood flavor from the oyster or lion's mane. So um, when a person says they don't like mushrooms, I said, what, well, do you like chicken? And then we usually get a yes, you know, and I'll, I'll ask other questions and we'll find out that you do like mushrooms. You just haven't had the right mushroom yet. And, and so that is the big thing there. Um, the competition is great because what it is, is it's continuing to educate more folks. So if I'm busy at my market stand, but someone else in Syracuse has mushrooms, they'll talk about mushrooms there. And so sometimes I'll make it and sometimes they'll make it. And so it's not that I'm always going to be there. Uh, so to rely on me getting your mushrooms every time is, is tough. And that's why I really like the education of growing your own and then also finding your own and being able to learn all those other things. Uh, I don't think I'll be able to feed the world mushrooms. I just, I can't put that on me. That's too much for me to do, but I can plant a seed to then say, well, I want to learn about mushrooms and I want to grow my own, or I want to experiment with this, or I want to at least learn these little things. And so then we'll talk about how to, how to cook mushrooms or whatever that may be. The small con conversations that we have then lead to them looking for more mushrooms. And 
I mean, that's led me to buy mushrooms from other people. I'm not, I don't only eat my mushrooms. There are certain mushrooms that are exotic to the, I'm not going to get them here that I thought, you know, would be for some of my friends are a great wedding present instead of uh, <laughs> something, something really uh, unique to the Pacific Northwest and, and stuff like that, that are, are prized mushrooms where a tradition in Japan would be, that would be their wedding gift was this one Matsutake. And, and so, you know, I kind of then stem off those other cultures. They're popular in other places. And, and so we're a little bit behind, I would say in the United States with the, with the fear of mushrooms, but there is, it is growing definitely. And there are a ton of mushroom lovers out there. Um, and so it's pretty neat. And I think we are starting to utilize that a little bit more. You can see as more companies become popular and they might kind of be more in the cities. Uh, Ithaca is a hot spot in Syracuse and Rochester. And, and as we then expand from that, just like naturally with the mushrooms expanding out, we start to then get in some smaller towns and really see that that, that can, can be uh, a good deal there. So I, I love it. The, the one can, I, I mean, the concern that I have with small town farmers markets is then we have a farmers market every day. And so again, competition is great, but then you also see that, well, we can't expect this one to always stay. If we have competition, there are some winners and some losers in that deal, which is perfectly fine. If I become a uh, someone that's not in the mushroom deal anymore, that then I hope somebody else fills that void and and takes over that too. That um, and same thing with with farmers markets. The good ones are going to stay, and some are going to suffer, and some are going to really prosper. And um, and I do think that people are making that trend back. It's great to see because I. There's such a difference in the freshness of food that that's one of the biggest things that I found is that even when it's shipped miles and miles into the supermarket, it looks fresh there. But the difference between me picking the broccoli the night before market and, and a person picking up broccoli from a supermarket is it's just astronomical. And, and the taste is really going to be the determining factor on that. And so I, I'm a big fan of the freshness. And uh, I mean, that's why I eat most of my meals out in the field. Um, just walking as I go, pocket beans are my favorite. So I'll keep beans in my pocket all day and, and pick a couple more as I need them. So, um, so I think that's a really big deal. And that's why people then get back to the farmer's market and, and it's really gained in popularity it's tough to grow all the different things. So we can grow things at home, focus on what you really want to grow, what you know you're going to use a lot of, and then rely on your local support system for the others. And so if I'm a mushroom man, great. And, and if you're the, the tomato gal, great, you know, and so we'll then help each other. And that's where a lot of things are like that. Um, I, I don't have any chickens or anything, but, but there are friends and there's other friends that grow different kinds of stuff. And so we then form a different network like that. And, uh, and be able to trade and work to work together. And also people have their different skills in, in what they really enjoy. And so when they talk about cattle or pigs and they get all lit up, I know that they're in the right deal. Um, when they talk about different sweet corn or whatever it may be, you know, I know they're in the right deal. Uh, talking about a medical field, I've had that. And that you're not getting me in a hospital too often. I mean, I might visit for certain folks, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time in the hospital. So everybody has their expertise and it's great. And just play those strengths and then help, help the others out. And, and I think that's why our system works so well. Would you be able to mention um, some of the, the mushrooms that you cultivate, some of the ones that you wild forage for, and then maybe mention some of the medicinal mushrooms uh, as we deal with COVID that are beneficial for the respiratory system? Yeah, so the major varieties that I cultivate, we'll start right there, the shiitake, the wine caps, the oyster mushrooms, the lion's mane. Those are probably my top four there. My taki does pretty well too, uh, but those are definitely, I would say my main four of that, just shiitake, oyster, lion's mane, wine cap. Uh, of course, I'm always expanding. I've tried, like I said, a, a little over a dozen varieties, and I'll continue to try another one. Chestnut is going to be the next time that I try. 
uh, probably here. And um, and so I've realized that I've got to stick with to make it a farm business. So I got to stick with the ones that are going to be reliable and and that people really like. And so I've, I've kind of stuck with those four lines, main being kind of the the weirder ones, but looking at least. But it's a a great conversation starter. And then again, I just love learning and then i think the my the lion's mane really helps me with that and so with any kind of memory um and and neural functions and, and helping with uh, that it's, i've really seen that help off um i won't say that i have a favorite mushroom but i do have a top like top i don't know it always seems to expand i start with five and then i think of a few more and so it's probably a top 10 that all seem to be favorites uh, definitely wild crafted. Um, one of those would be the chaga, and I'll just briefly talk on that because chaga is is one that I think the sustainability is really important. If we walk around the Adirondacks, we see little bits ripped off a tree, and those little bits are just about a fist size, and it doesn't make my blood boil. But I I I just wish I could talk to those folks and let them understand that the chaga mushroom will, is a perennial mushroom, it's going to continue to grow. And the way I think about it is it's not big enough until it's as big as my head. And it's going to be as big as my head when I see it. And then when I see it, I got a head this big because I think I'm great. Um, and so that's because the mushroom continues to grow over and over. And they've done research that it typically has its medicinal qualities when it's about seven years old. And that's the size. It's usually about seven pounds and it's about the size of my head. Now I do have a pretty, I don't know, decent size head. And, um, but we can think of it like that um, and inflate your ego just a little bit because you found a really cool mushroom and that's about the size that you want to harvest. Where if it's fist size and, and the smaller, it just doesn't have those medicinal qualities and we're just harvesting it quickly thinking that it's great, but but it's really then destroying the chance to take its full potential. And uh, that's a little, another little bit that when we eat raw mushrooms, I tend to not eat raw mushrooms because again, we, the mushrooms are so hard that they break through concrete, they break through wood, they break through all these different kinds of things. They've got a, a chemical like shellfish where it is strong enough to break through those things because the fruiting body has to push through with extreme force and break through that really I can't absorb the nutrients in a regular mushroom, a shiitake or a maitake without cooking down that mushroom and letting the heat break down that substance anyways. Um, <clears throat> other wild mushrooms that I really like to forage for, I mean, pretty soon we've got the morel season. To me, that's just a fun, fun walk in the woods to see if I can find it. Um, Flavor wise, uh, people love it, but I, I don't know. I've, I've had enough different mushrooms where I think it's, it's fancy, it's cool looking, but, um, but I'll sell it to you. Um, I don't know. I don't eat a ton. Um, so let me know if you want some, I'll, I'll be finding some and I'll sell them. Um, other wild crafted maitake is a pretty good one and chicken of the woods chicken of the woods has been one that i've wanted to grow outdoors naturally for a really long time and i just haven't had too much success with it and so a lot of that is wild crafted that i find but that's my mushroom uh that shocked the flipsy the, the permaculture course there when we found that it was about a 35 pound specimen uh, one of them and so we took the one out of the three and we fed a whole course full of people and and i like to say that that's the mushroom that has non-mushroom lovers loving mushrooms and um because it's i mean who a boneless chicken wing a boneless chicken tenders to me um that's the one too that i'll eat not healthy um with frying up and, and battering and frying and and making like a boneless wing out of uh, but the the texture of chicken you can certainly eat healthy but i i splurge on that time um but the texture and the consistency of that mushroom is something that really gets a lot of folks and thinking wow like mushrooms have a lot of different possibilities 
and to me it's a big one and usually we find a nice big harvest and it's and it's a communal kind of mushroom where it really brings everybody together like i've got way too much i can't i can freeze a little bit but i can't eat this all alone so let's have a little party and uh and maybe this year it'll be uh, here's a little drive through whatever it may be uh other than that i mean i love to find the black trumpets i i just the lobster mushrooms there are a ton of mushrooms around here and and i do love to run into those uh, the lion's mane will definitely be another wild mushroom oyster i'd rather have the cultivated variety if i'm going to do that because it's tough to get the right texture with that the right age and so a lot of oyster mushrooms when they are outside they have a little bit too much moisture usually and too over old because they grow so quickly um <clears throat> The bluets are again one of those that I've I've done cultivated and have some some okay success with. They're tougher to grow, but um, hmm. I mean, there's a lot of mushrooms that I'd love to find. It's it's tough. Like I said, I just I, someday I'll take a trip other places and then uh, really find some some good I, I think there's a lot better spots in the, the united states with morels and then uh, of course the truffles um when i head to europe someday and really finding out that uh most of those truffle snobs would say we probably won't like them because they smell like dirty socks and so it, it's really an acquired taste and you really again you want the freshness is what really matters but being one of the most expensive mushrooms you might as well try it and then of course a trip to Asia where I could really expand and find a lot of the deep history with that, the Matsutakis, uh, and and just find some some wild ones out there too. So around here it, it's it's more of a walk in the woods, and then it's what do I find in that walk in the woods? I don't tend to hunt mushrooms anymore. That seemed to me to me take away the fun of it. It was more of well, now I'm out here for business and I don't want to be out in the woods for business. I want to be out in the woods for pleasure. So it's a dog walk with a friend. And, uh, and then what do we run into? And that's kind of the, the more fun of it for me is uh, just enjoying nature and then saying, whoa, look at this all of a sudden and being kind of surprised. Uh, red and yellow bullets are something that I would caution, but uh, definitely something that I'm, you get to find the, the, the outdoor, the wild mushrooms, you, t you do tend to find a rhythm with the nature. And so like the, the morels, we tend to find little uh, hints in nature that aren't necessarily the mushroom, but uh, do the buds on the oak tree, have they started yet or not? And so we get to really find other cues and that helps you then look at nature a little bit closer and do then say, well, I'm, I will take a little walk in the woods uh, and see what happens. But most of it is just fun walks in the woods and, and see what happens rather than hunting for mushrooms to me seems like a job. And there are definitely people that do that and they spend a lot of time in their car out in the woods. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I like the, uh, the uh, house kind of deal a little bit better than, than being in a car all the time. So, and I like the consistency of knowing, well, I've got these shiitakes that are going to produce for me at this time. I mean, I'm down, I've got it down to a science where eight weeks in a row, I know I've got another batch of shiitakes coming and then I take a couple of weeks off in the middle of the summer and then I got another eight weeks of shiitakes at the end of, of soaked logs. Uh, that's something we didn't talk about that the, the wide range in the, the warm weather logs is going a soaking tank overnight and so I can really force those to fruit. The cold weather varieties don't respond to forest fruiting, but Basically, I take a big log, that log that we will see, and I put it in a, a tank, an ag tank of some sort with water, and let that sit overnight, and then pull it back out onto the fruiting rail, and uh, and then I'll get mushrooms in a week from that. And so I I like to control when I'm doing a farming deal of that as much as I can, and in the production because I know I want to go to market, and I've got these weeks where those those are a little bit different there. I take take a nice walk in the woods is different than trying to make a job out of it. Was there one more thing? I thought there was a third question. How about respiratory? Any mushrooms good for respiratory? Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. So that's, um, could be tough to find, but definitely I would look at the Rishi mushrooms. Um, 
I am a, a fan of the fungi perfecti being that I, I did tour the lab. I do know his high standards. I do understand his, his technique and, and really can stand by that product. I mean, I don't take part in it, but, but at least my experience with it, that he really holds it, the company and itself up to the highest standards. And so fungi perfecti is probably where I'd go. Um, and I like to buy in batches because I'm cheap, so I buy in bulk. But um, there's different takes on that. Now, if you just want to focus on one thing, sure, then the Rishi, and I think there's a Rishi uh, Cordyceps mix that they do a blend of. And I don't know the products that well, but I'm pretty sure there is a, a pill and a powder of those um, to take the capsules, it's basically the mycelium and and the fruiting body of each, and that will help with some energy um, and and some lung capacity there. But also, the the major thing is to increase health everywhere, and that's where I've kind of then said, well, I feel like as a whole, my body's pretty healthy, so how can I then help everything? And there's blends with more mushrooms in it, and so that wouldn't hurt. I would only uh, does have the reishi, it does have the cordyceps, but then I can add in the shiitake, the maitake, and those, and those kind of things. And to add to that only helps the whole body. Um, and so that's kind of the different things where I've learned, uh, again, in permaculture and the herbalist courses that I've taken and the mushroom courses, that ultimately we want to help the whole system. That if I focus on one area, then that one area is strong, but that will only then lead to a place that doesn't have that strength being compromised. And so I really want to build up the system as a whole and, and not just treat one area. Now, certainly I know we're focusing on some lung health right now, but that's not to say that in a month or two years from now or however long from now, that something new could come along and then go to a certain area. And so I think as we build the system as a whole, ecologically and physically inside that if we take the body as a temple and then treat it as such as we continue to strengthen every aspect of it we'll really see the benefits and that's that's how i've now viewed it where i was focusing on a little bit before the uh, tax season i really am stressing out the brain so how can i do that but then you know i realized through my mistakes that well now physically how am i doing um, health-wise should I probably get down and do some push-ups and stuff like that yeah let's get let's get a little more active because the brain is working really hard but can we pump some blood and and get some some other body parts moving um, and the same thing in the in the farm is that then it's such a physical thing and you see those logs are most of them are three to four feet long and, and pretty heavy and so how taxing can it be on the body and so I've got to diversify my work in all areas of that and then also in the health field I think and so to continue to build up the whole system but definitely we can focus on different um, different body parts in times of need um, I've taken herbalism courses and I'm not going to touch too much on that but there definitely are certain herbs that will help with that and I'm sure there are different herbal companies that will sell products focused on on the lungs and and even in the mushroom thing i think he does mix some with some different herbs um but as we as we look that was the major thing so the doctrine of signatures if it looks like the lungs um then it then it's probably going to help out the lungs and and so we can think of well what do i look what does that body part look like like the eyes for example if we cut a carrot and we see the circular motion of the carrot and how it looks like an eye and we've got that uh, walnuts for the brain and, and different things like that. So we we do already kind of know a little bit about that. We've just got to realize, well, now I've got to look at these different foods and they do look like my body parts. And so that will definitely help. So eating healthy and then taking some supplements, I'm, I'm right on board with uh, most of the time. But eating, eating to enjoy it too. I mean, there's definitely times I'll cheat, but... <clears throat> Well, we've definitely been on here for a while, over an hour. Um, 
Kate, was there anything that you wanted to have him add or anything like that? I think that's pretty thorough. I think we've we've hit on I think you did a beautiful job. I think we covered everything. Um I think it was good that we had that last little bit that was really explicit to health. Uh Noah, I didn't know that you knew so much about being healthy and herbalism and that sort of stuff. So that was really cool to hear about. Um but I think we're in a pretty good spot. Yeah, I would say we have a ton to kind of go through and um and I think that uh, I'm hoping that between Lyndon and I, we'll be able to pick out and shorten this down into a 45-ish minute uh, <laughs> talk. <laughs> yeah, we we knew. I warned you. What's the time limit? And you said un endless. So, uh, <laughs> we knew that was going to be a problem because because I'll talk about some mushrooms and uh, herbalism and again a, a little side passion. And, and if you want to talk about taxes, let me know and all that kinds of fun stuff. So. No, it's, it's it's good to have more than less. Definitely good to have good to have more to go through than less to go through. So, knowledge is power. So, uh, open up a book and 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 then dive in and find some research. And once find a passion and and then dig into it, and we'll uncover a lot of different stuff. And then you'll find a lot of neat folks that do that too. And that's kind of how it started with just a little mushroom passion, and and then realizing, well, this is bigger than that at permaculture. And then what's well, permaculture leads to herbalism and and everything in between and so it continues to unfold at a, a beautiful picture i think and and also connect all these different dots that i didn't know existed before so thanks for having me on both of you i really appreciate that and um and letting me take up a fun saturday and, and doing a little project here and of course talking about one of my favorite things thanks so much for joining us noah so before we completely end, um, and Kate, you can disappear for this. I'm just going to ask Noah. Uh, so this is for sustainability, the sustainability office uh, for Earth Week. So if there's something that you could share with people uh, less than two minutes long, uh, you know, about either sustainability or the importance, importance of, of taking care of the environment. Um, you kind of touched on it, talking about the not over harvesting and stuff, but um, if there's something that you could share with people that, that you feel is really important about either Earth Week or sustainability, if you would share that. Yeah, Earth Week is important to me because it gets me back in touch with nature and, and with my roots. And what it does is it allows me some time to really learn from, I think, the ultimate teacher in nature and observe uh, patterns more and more. And that's when this when I when it all started, it was a lot of observing, a lot of watching, a lot of learning, a lot of listening closely, watching closely, and for for a full season. So for me, Earth Week doesn't end, but it starts off a great season, and I continue to watch and look at the changes in nature. And as I get more involved in nature, I start to respect it more, and I start to then see how much I can really benefit from it, um, and be able to share with my friends and family and so it provides endless abundance for us in all different aspects whether it be me just taking a walk in the woods to clear my head or finding food out and uh or just a, a spot to play a spot to build a fort to, to climb a tree uh to do some pull-ups on a branch you know it's just to me it, it it provides everything that i need and and that's why i've really taken the responsibility to take care of it and then provide others for that. And so um, I think a famous quote, the best time to plant a tree is seven years ago, but the second best time is today. And so if we can continue to do that, uh, as we make nature healthier, we'll be healthier. And then also future generations, this is gonna, it's hard to see the impact in the future, but it is neat to see when I get to play around in a different area and as I see a spot grow up and look back on pictures and the way the, the soil used to be, I really see the growth and the richness of the soil and the richness of the area and the different feel that it has. And a lot of the people that come on the farm then get to say that, that the vibe is just different here, that the, the aura, the energy, is, is out of this world and it's it's really neat because I'm so getting so used to the the great energy 
And when that outsiders come on and then they really see, wow, this place has something special, um, it confirms that, that things are being done right. And so that's really neat to see too. So 